Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Evan Eskew, and I'm a faculty member in the PLU Department of Biology. Welcome to our fifth annual Rachel Carson Science, Technology, and Society Lecture. Tonight, we're joined by a virtual audience in addition to our guests here with us in the Karen Hilly Phillips Center. Welcome all, and thank you for being with us. This lecture is funded by a generous donation from Dr. George Long, a PLU alumnus in biology and chemistry from the class of 1966, and his wife, Helen. Please join me in thanking George and Helen for helping to make this event possible. I'd now like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of this land, the Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, and Stelecom peoples. I hope that tonight's lecture might encourage you to see the natural world a little differently and to consider how others interact with the land and the life that it holds. Certainly indigenous peoples all over the world provide excellent models for ways of living that acknowledge and work with the complexity of natural systems. In that way, they show us how human societies might be better integrated with nature. They show us ways to benefit from nature's bounty while respecting nature's boundaries. Let's grant that there is the possibility of harmonious relation between human societies and nature. I want to move towards tonight's lecture topic by asking a slightly different question, by asking whether human societies should be modeled after nature. Can we base our moral aspirations and ethical ideals on what we see in the natural world? This is a question that has been of significant historical interest. Professor Lorraine Dastin summarizes it like this. In various and dispersed traditions, nature has been upheld as the pattern of all values, the good, the true, and the beautiful. Yet here we encounter a major problem. When different people and different cultures have tapped into nature's supposed repository of truth, they have settled on drastically different conclusions. Nature's moral compass doesn't seem to point in a single direction. Professor Dastin explains, nature has been invoked to emancipate as, a, as the guarantor of human equality and to enslave as the foundation of racism. Nature's authority has been enlisted by reactionaries and by revolutionaries alike. British philosopher John Stuart Mill sketched the issue even more starkly. He said, either it is right that we should kill because nature kills, torture because nature tortures, ruin and devastate because nature does the like, or we ought not to consider at all what nature does and do what is good to do. We ought not to consider at all what nature does. That's a pretty strong condemnation of using nature as a model for human affairs. Perhaps nature is not the best guide for our moral imagination. But what if we're less concerned with philosophy and more concerned with physical things, with structures, objects, materials? Can nature play a role there? Indeed, there's an entire field of inquiry that believes it can. That field is biomimicry. Broadly, biomimicry is the conscious emulation of nature as applied to humanity's physical and technological problems. You probably benefit from biomimicry even if you don't realize it. Examples of biomimicry are everywhere. Consider the fine layer of downy feathers that cover many newborn birds, but also exist under the tougher outer layer of feathers on adult birds. These down feathers are excellent insulators. Um, helping to conserve body heat. Humans have caught on to the idea and we use down feathers or synthetic replicas to insulate a variety of products. Bedding and pillows, sleeping bags, perhaps a jacket that you wear regularly, perhaps one that you have on right now. One clothing brand's name, Canada Goose, nods directly to this avian inspiration. Insulation materials might be an example of biomimicry that's close to home, but the field's purview extends much more broadly. Designers, artists, architects, engineers, and scientists of all stripes have used ideas drawn from nature, and as a result, our lives are shaped by biomimicry. Tonight, it is my distinct honor to welcome to our campus a leading expert on biomimicry, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Dana Baumeister. Dr. Baumeister is an author, professor, and co-founder of Biomimicry 3.8 
an organization that trains, certifies, and connects biomimicry professionals worldwide. With a background in biology and interest in natural history, and a love for connecting people with the wonders of nature, Dr. Baumeister has worked in the field of biomimicry with business partner Dr. Janine Binyas since 1988 as a business catalyst, educator, and researcher. Dr. Baumeister has consulted with over, has consulted with over 100 companies that have sought to harness the natural world for elegant design solutions, some of which you may have heard of, including Nike, Microsoft, Ford, General Mills, and Boeing. She is senior editor of the Biomimicry Resource Handbook, published in 2014, and serves as the co-director of Arizona State University's Biomimicry Center. In sum, Dr. Baumeister's work uses the lens of biomimicry to help others see how humanity might enter into an apprenticeship with nature as our mentor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Baumeister. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm glad you were able to join us, get out of the house a little bit, right? Maybe our first venture out um, as, we, as we move through this space of, of the great pause. Um, I hope in this time that you had the opportunity to do some, some gazing uh, and begin to imagine what a world that works uh, works well might look like and hopefully by the end of the evening here you'll have a little bit of the perspective that I hold deeply which is this is an e e excellent example of a world that works um, and uh, there's, there's a lot that surrounds us. But before we get into that um, I also want to acknowledge that we probably feel a lot like this lately. Um, and there's, there's a lot that we're trying to manage um, when you look at, you know, I mean, Ukraine, right? We've got uh, the pandemic to worry about, and we've got Black Lives Matter to worry about, and the Me Too movement to worry about, and the opioid crisis, and the biodiversity loss, and catastrophic weather events like major flooding that's happening today in this part of the world and widening inequality and pollution and homelessness and crumbling infrastructure and refugees and immigration and student loan debt and climate change. <sighs> but I want to put it a little bit in perspective, as overwhelming as that feels, um, and to consider the planet and the fact that we're talking about these weights, these worries here in 2022, um, which is just really a blink of an eye for the age of the planet. So if we take this, if we take this planet, which is four and a half billion years, and we compress it into just one year, so that Earth is born just a breath after midnight on January 1st. And we're standing here today in 2020 with all of these worries, a breath before midnight on December 31st. I wanna put it into a little bit of perspective for you. I'm noticing my slides here aren't advancing, so I'm gonna have to do a little bit of back and forth here. So the first six weeks is the primordial soup. Right? This is that thing with the volcanic action and the planets forming and all this stuff happening. And it isn't until February 25th that we see life appear. In fact, we just celebrated life's birthday uh, in my organization. We sent out a birthday card to life and said, happy birthday. Um, and that was actually 3.8 billion years ago, 3.85 billion years ago, um, hence the name of our organization, Biomimicry 3.8, uh, to honor how long life has been around. And believe it or not, those first early, early uh, single-celled organisms, the stromatolites, are still present here today. Um, so those are, it, it, the, the, you can find them off the coast of Australia, you can find them in calderas, um, the, the, the lakes at the tops of volcanoes. And then the first month 
it took for photosynthesis to arrive. So March 28th is when we started converting this very um, carbon dioxide rich atmosphere to an oxygen rich atmosphere when photosynthesis uh, evolved and you had all these single celled organisms learning how to make use out of all of that CO2. And then believe it or not, it took the rest of March into April and May and June and July. And it wasn't until August that we started seeing some multi-celled organisms. So it was all just single cell happening in the sea. And then a month later, we actually had sex for the first time, right? That's when, when genes mixed and we actually, it wasn't just cloning, but it was a mixing of DNA between these single-celled and multi-celled organisms. And we didn't actually see anything on terra firma, at least that we could see in the fossil record, until November 15th, which was literally just six weeks ago. And of course, it was the fungi. The fungi showed up first, and they began breaking down the rocks and turning it into soil that ultimately could be useful for other organisms. And meanwhile, in the sea, the first vertebrates show up the fish in November 20th. And then not until November 26th, 22nd, do we have land plants, right? So photosynthesizing plants on land. The insects follow shortly thereafter, November 24th. Amphibians, December 2nd, they have to stay very close to water. They have to lay their eggs in water. They have to keep their skin wet. But as soon as they figured out that whole skin water dryness thing, we begin to see reptiles. They show up on December 6th, and thus begins the age of the dinosaurs. Only 25 days uh, ago did this happen on the planet. Mammals showed up December 13th. You might have noticed that we haven't showed up yet. December 18th, the birds, flowers, December 20th. They're only 11 days old, flowers on the planet. Homo sapiens is still not here, but on December 25th, a really long time ago, the dinosaurs went extinct, right? Really bad Christmas day for the dinosaurs, right? Um, at 1830, 630 in the evening is when the asteroid hit uh, the planet, and that was the end of the era of the dinosaurs. We're still not here, but early hominids, we did show up. The hominids, the first two-legged creatures, showed up today on December 31st, a little bit more than 12 and a half hours ago in our year. So humans, December 31st, 35 minutes ago, that's when Homo sapiens showed up. And the vast majority of those 35 minutes was hunters and gatherers. And it was only in the last minute did we settle for agriculture about 10,000 years ago. And the entire industrial revolution, life as we know it, all those things that we were worrying about, have happened in the last two seconds. The last two seconds of our year. And yet somehow we think that all of our answers about what it means to be a human, to live well on this planet, are what has transpired in the last two seconds. And we've missed even the last minute of knowledge, let alone the last 35 minutes of knowledge, let alone all of those months that preceded it. It gives us the opportunity to pause and think a little bit differently about how we might approach moving forward. Um, you know, in, in that time, we've managed to colonize all of terra firma, and a little bit of the ocean too. And we've taken life's wood and water, her minerals, her coal, her soil, her biodiversity, her oxygen, her land. We've made use of all of these things. Um, but the reality is we're at a point where we're going, mm, this may be not working out so well for us. So, so what do we do now? We've, we've gone around the planet and we've bumped into ourselves. There's, there really isn't anything more left for us to take. 
We've exhausted that and thus we have the challenges that we have. But the reality is, is the planet is ours, but it's not ours alone. We're only one of at least 30 million species, maybe upwards of 100 million species. And that represents the living species, the ones that have like figured out and are here now, which is less than 1% of all the species that have ever lived on the planet, right? We're a blip. We are really a blip in the planet. In fact, we've probably, scientists estimate another five and a half billion years before the sun burns out. So we're, we're just like a little slice in the middle of this big time frame. So we have these incredible sustainable development goals that are beginning to stitch together all of these elements. Um, and we have no shortage of questions nor opportunities before us. This is, this is our time as a species. This is our time to figure out how we get to be a welcome species and how we get to stay. And what is that going to look like? So we can ask around, right? And what I would argue is that our asking around is not asking each other, but perhaps asking nature. Right? Perhaps looking and asking someone else that's been around a little bit longer. Maybe we should ask our elders that have been here for months in our, in our year. And in order to do that, in order to do that possibility to explore that, it starts with awe. It doesn't start with a scientific method, but it starts with awe. And, and science has actually shown that when we're in a place of awe, we have so many incredible benefits. When you live in awe, you have improved health, you have a greater sense of embeddedness, pretty important, as we feel so disconnected from each other and from our place, but you feel that connected embeddedness. You have enhanced critical thinking, a good skill that we could all use right now. People become more cooperative when they have an opportunity to be in a place of awe. They become more creative. They become kinder. And probably most importantly, they feel a sense of increased and actually perform in more generous ways. What greater place to find awe but in the ecosystems around us? Right? Whether it's in the Sonoran Desert or along a tropical beach, um, mangroves, the bats, incredible flower. I mean, nature's just like one awe-inspiring landscape after another, and of course, this one in our own backyard, the boreal lights. In fact, our planet is full of millions, billions of awe-inspiring landscapes. And what's happening in every one of these landscapes is that they're creating conditions conducive to life. And as nature, right, as a, as a species on this planet, shouldn't we also be doing the same? Shouldn't that be our work in the world to create conditions conducive to life? Because, you know, we, we are nature after all. We've forgotten that we're nature. We've become disconnected, um, but we are very, very much nature, um, even if we've just been here just a short while. And what, what nature offers for us, what life offers, that question of should we look, is it offers a vision to design towards. Right? We, we know what we don't want to do anymore. We know we should do less of this and less of that and don't use so much energy. And this, but where are we heading towards? And for me, nature offers what that vision could look like. Um, and inherently, in all of this, we know that ecosystems are inherently generous, right? And not only are they awe-inspiring, they produce oxygen, they manage temperatures, they buffer extremes, they provide biodiversity, they do all this, this work just inherently. They just do it, not, not for our sake, but it's an emergent property that life offers us. And so maybe we could be not only awed by nature, but also be generous 
to nature and with nature. And so I'd like to have you think about this question of how might we reciprocate nature's generosity? What, what could that look like? You know, as I mentioned in the beginning, all we've done is take wood, water, minerals, food, crops, soil. What if we were to actually begin to reciprocate that generosity? What could that look like? What if our communities and our, our landscapes were pollinator friendly? What if they also stored water and carbon in the landscapes? What if our roofs not only protected us from the rain, but produced food while also storing carbon and storing water? What if they allowed wildlife to migrate? What if all of our right-of-ways recharged the groundwater? Different ways for us to think about what we build. Could our right-of-ways also be a place to generate power? Right? What would it look like if we were actively engaged in not thinking that this was all just here for us, but that we were part of a larger ecosystem? What if our agriculture built healthy soils, not depleted the health from our soils and purified our waterways? What if our harvest supported women entrepreneurs and provided opportunities for right livelihoods? Right? A very, very different framing about how we go about it. What if we embraced ancient wisdom, not just of our indigenous cultures, but also from all the species? And what if our cities and our built environments actually produced ecosystem services instead of just took ecosystem services by looking towards life and biomimicry design to benefit all of life? This is ultimately where we need to go. And this is really what biomimicry is about. It's the conscious emulation of nature's genius. And those four words are very carefully chosen. So, so conscious, you, you, you mentioned that in the beginning. Thank you for that. Conscious is we have the intention to ask nature for advice. It's not just accidental and we did this and, oh, look, nature does that too. But we actually made a choice to ask nature, how have you done it since February 25th? How have you thrived? How have you survived in this way? And emulation is also really important because we're not copying nature, but we're borrowing the best design principles and applying them. We're not, we're not building a, a helicopter that flies like a dragonfly, like the laws of physics don't actually allow that. But can we learn from the aerodynamics that those wings provide and offer new opportunities for how we navigate and fly through the air? And nature's genius is based on the premise of well, she's been around for a long time. There's a lot of genius in that, a lot of success stories in that that we can learn from. But I also want to acknowledge that biomimicry is an emerging discipline of an ancient practice. Right? So it's, it's a new science in which we're developing methodologies and frameworks and tools, but simultaneously it's deep within who we are as a species. Right? We have always asked our elders, the other species, the local genius, for advice. Until we started surrounding ourselves with brick walls and concrete underfoot and air conditioning services, and, and, and we've, we've lost that connection. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at our traditional ecological knowledge that indigenous communities historically and presently offer, that's that deep ancient practice. And we need to remember that once again. Right? And so biomimicry offers a little bit of an opportunity to begin doing that. And what it ultimately is, it's the intersection between biology, nature, life, everything that we can begin to understand and love, whether it's awe-inspiring or, you know, technologically, scientifically accurate, and this world of design and innovation and technology on the other side. And when we bring those two together and we find the intersection in the middle, 
That's really where biomimicry plays. And by design, we also think about things like everything humans create. We, we might design a better communication system. We might design better ways to collaborate. Those are also opportunities in which we can learn from nature. And it's an incredibly powerful opportunity. Um, right now we know we've, we've named two and a half million species. That's all we've given names to, which means we know what it is and we know where it lives. And that's all, we, you know, for a lot of them, a much smaller part do we know anything more about it. Um, but there's been some interesting research done that took the human patent database, we have about two and a half million active patents, and overlaid the two and said, okay, well, this is how humans solve things, and this is how life solved things. Is there much of an overlap? And it turns out that the overlap is only 12%. So only 12%, leaving 88% of opportunity for us to imagine entirely different ways of inventing, right? Because just about everything that we want to do, life has figured out. We're not the only ones that have to circumnavigate the globe, that have to protect our, our, our materials from degradation, that need to communicate long distances, that need to figure out how to develop and grow in balanced ways. I mean, you name it, life has figured out how to do this. So we look to nature as model, as measure, and as mentor. And it's a new way of looking and valuing nature that's based not on what we can extract, but on the lessons that we can learn. The Industrial Revolution was based on what we could take. And here we're not taking anything. We're saying, excuse me, can we borrow your recipe? Right? I've heard it's pretty good, and I'd like to try it out, which is a very, very different relationship. Um, and I believe it will ultimately have you know, a, a beneficial effect on how we act and behave. We don't trash on our teachers, right? We take care of our teachers. And when we have that mindset, um, that can really change the way those things are done. So this is a little bit about how this process works. If you can imagine that over in this world, we have all of our design challenges, and we have to figure out how are we going to learn from nature, and we have to translate that into a question of how might nature solve these human design challenges. And then we get to walk across what I call the function bridge. And we walk across the function bridge over to the world of biology, the world of science and understanding how life works. And then once we learn about some potential answers to the questions that we have, we cross over and then we bring back a, the design principle. We bring back a lesson. And then we get to go back and then figure out how we can come up with a solution on the other side. So there's, I'm going to share some examples with you so that you can see uh, what this looks like. But it's an important way to begin to have that sort of cooperative relationship um, between ourselves as a species and the other species on the planet. And I have a pretty big database of all these examples. When I first started in this work, um, Janine, my, my business partner, she, she wrote the book on biomimicry, gave it the name Biomimicry, and she had found and collected lots of examples of people learning from nature, but they didn't have a name that they put it under. And she published this book in 97. And in the beginning, I could keep track of all the examples. And, and the beauty is that over the last 24 years, um, there's so many, maybe it's also old age, I can't keep track anymore, but, but I, we, we, we can't keep track. We have a database of over 5,000 examples of where people are learning from nature. Um, but I selected some that are really in this spirit of, of being generous and examples that we can use in order to live more um, wholly in, in generosity with nature. So I'm going to share a few of these examples. Um, so this first one, this was actually developed by some students who participated in the biomimicry design challenge. 
And they were very interested in the question of how can we do better reforestation? And how can we have what we plant when we're trying to restore these landscapes and habitats? How can they survive better, these young seedlings? And so they were inspired by um, bromeliads, which are a tropical plant. This was a, a, a team from Brazil that are, have, are, they hold tanks. They, they, they have tank plants and they hold water in them that help support uh, not only the, the plant itself, but they have their own little pond ecosystem happening in there. And they use that as sort of their design principle of how could they make sort of these tank type planters that also biodegrade, they help add nutrients to the soil um, for the seedling. And so over time, as that seedling starting to develop, the, the, the planter itself is breaking down, providing nutrients, as well as pro providing that steady um, water supply. And they're called Nucleario, and they're, they're making them. They're making them and putting them out um, as they're doing uh, reforestation projects in the Amazon and in other parts of South America. This one comes from a company called Eco Concrete. I really like this one because it's got a couple of levels of biomimicry. At one level, they actually learned from how nature um, builds coral reefs in terms of actually sequestering carbon dioxide as a building blocks. So the concrete itself, unlike the concrete that is traditional concrete, which emits carbon dioxide, this concrete sequesters carbon dioxide to make it. But they didn't stop with just using it in building projects. They said, what if we used it to build infrastructure along our coastal waterways in such a way that we're mimicking what those ecosystems might otherwise look like and support biota. So in, rather than putting in big seawalls and blocks that, you know, of course are not very good for, for um, ocean erosion, they said, well, what if we put in shapes that sort of created little mini ponds and little tide pools? Could we both support and, and protect our coastlines while also providing habitat. Um, and in, in this case, it's not just you know, seaweed and algae, but you can actually see bivalves and mussels and oysters and so on growing in these places. So, so we built a seawall, we got our function met, we have our, our protection from those ocean forces, but we've added habitat and we've sequestered carbon at the same time, all by learning from nature's forms and shapes, as well as her processes in uh, how, that, um, how CO2 is captured. This is also in the sea. Um, this is Boscalis, it's an Italian company. And what I really like about this is, is they've used 3D printing and they're 3D printing with materials that also sequester carbon, but they studied the micro texture of coral reefs in order to create artificial reefs so that when polyps, little coral polyps are floating in the sea and they settle down, they literally have the tactile recognition of, oh, I probably have landed on a piece of coral. I should start growing now. Um, and so they've had huge, huge successes in repopulating reefs where um, there's been coral bleaching or there's been a, some, some other form of destruction to the reef by mimicking the texture of existing coral species through a 3D printing technology that sequesters uh, carbon. Also in the sea, this is from some work that we did with uh, Interface Carpets. And um, our, our work actually with them started a long time ago where we begin to ask the question, well, how would nature design a floor? Um, and in fact, this carpet here might even be an interface carpet where the, um, they, they were very cognizant of when you walk across a forest floor, it kind of looks like everything goes together, but yet it's, it's all very different. And they ultimately designed a carpet tile where it all looks like it goes together, but every tile is unique in its own way. So it had these great aesthetic qualities, but it turned out to also have these great environmental qualities in that the cutoff, the selvage, and the installation process could be used anywhere else because you didn't have to pattern match. They could use all sorts of threads even if the dye, light, dye lot was a little bit off because it didn't have to be perfect. Um, they didn't have to worry about so much coming off the manufacturing line. If there was an imperfection, it would be blended. So huge, huge material savings made it very easy to install, to replace, 
this. Um, we worked with them later to figure out ways to attach the tiles together that mimicked the way nature did. And then they ultimately got to um, a little bit here and one I'll show you a little bit later where they have uh, nylon is the key component in the surface of the, or the surface coating of the carpet. And nylon is the same thing that fishing nets are made out of. So they developed a program in the Philippines and Malaysia where they work with local communities to clean up their reefs of the discarded fishing nets, clean those nets on the beach for a good living wage, and then those nets go back and get recycled into new carpet fibers um, that go in, into their carpets. And then they also recycle fibers when they recycle the carpets. So creating a circular economy in a way that both supports livelihoods restores the reef and gives them the raw materials so that they don't actually have to use any virgin nylon um, anymore. And it all comes from this sort of ecosystem thinking in the way that they go about and approach the work in the world. Um, I mentioned the fixing carbon with concrete. Um, I actually talked to the inventor of, of this just the other day. And what Blue Planet is doing is not only replacing the limestone, the cement part, which is, is, is the main part where we, pr we emit CO2 when we, when we make um, cement, but he also recognized that it's the, it's the gravel and the rock that is a huge, uh, big by weight part of concrete. So he's figured out how to take CO2 out of smokestacks he was a coral reef biologist. By studying coral reefs, take the CO2 out of smokestacks and use it to create the aggregate, the bulk of cement. Um, and so his, his concrete is not just carbon neutral, it's carbon negative, right? So it, it actually sequesters 700 metric tons for every metric ton of concrete, um, which is just metric tons of CO2. So huge, huge wins. And um, what he's been doing, so he learned from that higher level or, or the process level in biomimicry of, of how corals make concrete or make hard materials. But then he took it to the next level and said, how can I change the system so this kind of work is is predominant and got in, in San Francisco, got them to write laws into all new public infrastructure that requires the, the concrete used to be sequestering carbon rather than producing carbon, right? So, so you have this larger, larger impact of benefit um, in the system. Here's another example. Um, this is a small energy company that was building dams. And of course, we knew dams cause problems for salmon, and they cause all sorts of problems for other fish moving through the, the waterways. And so they said, well, why don't we mimic nature's dams? And so they have um, designed their hydropower dams to mimic the way beavers work. And of course, we know when a beaver makes a dam, it actually increases the biodiversity and increases the, um, the habitat diversity in a space while still allowing water to move through, while still allowing fish to migrate um, upstream. And so this um, company, Natel, has done these beaver hydropower and they've used it to actually restore landscapes. So it's especially important where they've been channelized and there's a single river. And when they put that in, then it creates more of a meandering stream, we get the power that we wanted, but we've actually restored the habitat in the meantime um, by learning from the beaver. This is also a great one. This is, uh, we always think of, of land farming and from the ocean, we just go in with big nets and scoop and, and harvest. This guy, Brett Trimble, um, has developed a, a system for um, developing three, what he calls 3D ocean farming. So rather than just growing oysters in one place or growing mussels in one place, he's got an infrastructure system where he lays down 
uh, lines, grows algae, but he's, he's designed it kind of like mimicking a, a sea kelp bed where he can grow the oysters and the mussels and the algae and the fish and have a, a lar- like an p- underwater permaculture and have this large system. He's actually done the math and says if you could, you could cultivate an area the size of Washington State, um, it would be enough to feed the globe. Um, that, that it can be that productive because he's created an, an ecosystem of food rather than a monocrop of, of food, and in this case, um, under the ocean. <clears throat> uh, this is a great one. This is in Thailand. Um, this is also giving back to the ecosystem and performing ecosystem services. In this case, it's a, um, a flood park um, in the, in the, it's called Centennial Park. And what they, the, the architect, the landscape architect did was actually mimic um, and think about this particular tree. I think it's called the monkey tree and, and how it, it recharges the groundwater when it floods and designed a series of paths and channels, if you will, in such a way in the park, and you can see by the diagram up in the top, that, they, that they're able to do flood attenuation while recharging and cleaning that water, right? So cleaning the groundwater. Actually, in, in some parts of the park, they have tanks, and those tanks provide fresh water because they've been cleaned as it's gone through the park, as well as dealing with the flood. Um, very different where we just tend to put it in a channel and ship it off to the sea. So a different way of, of thinking about it by looking at the local species and asking, how do you deal with floods here? This is in um, Jordan and Qatar, and um, I believe there's another one happening in Morocco. Um, this is called the Sahor- Sahara Forest Project. This is a combination of Concentrated solar, which is not biomimetic, which is these spiral ones, but seawater greenhouses, which mimic some of the evaporative techniques that halophytes use, and using um, salt-loving species to both provide the crops that we need, but because of how these are designed, and you can see in these drawings in the, in the, the upper part here, they actually allow them to restore forest uh, in these otherwise um, completely decimated parts of the Sahara. The Sahara, of course, was forested not that long ago. Um, and so beginning to bring back um, vegetation, and vegetation begets more vegetation because it traps the moisture and so on. So creating a large-scale restoration effort um, that provides food, cleans water, provides water to to plant, not, for, not just for the greenhouse, but also for the plants used to restore um, the forest. And there's different evaporative uh, techniques, some of which mimic the inside of a camel's nose, uh, that are used in, in those projects. And now let's go to the grasslands. So this is a great project. This is in, um, at the Land Institute in Kansas. And what they're studying is how the tall grass prairie is so productive. And one of the things that they learned is that um, a tall grass prairie has four main kinds of species. It has cool season grasses and warm season grasses and sunflowers and legumes. Of course, there's many, many wild species within that. Well, Almost all of our crops fit in those categories too. Cool season grasses, warm season grasses, sunflower species, and legumes, the beans. And so what they've been doing for the last 30 years is um, re-perennializing those crops, which we turned into annuals, re-perennializing them and mixing them together in mixed cropped um, fields. So we no longer have to till, you no longer have to water, You no longer have to add pesticides. You no longer have to add herbicides. And you have greater productivity coming out of them by mimicking the way the tall grass prairie 
works. Of course, when we built our monocultures and we plant these, we have to add fertilizer because there's only one crop going there and you don't have the legumes to put the nitrogen back in the soil. We have to add pesticides because of course there's only one crop. So a pest comes in, it's a heyday and it just keeps feeding. But when you have this diversity, then you no longer have soil erosion and so on. So beautiful, beautiful work that they're doing in creating these um, perennial polycultures. I mentioned Interface before. This is our, our latest work with Interface. Is so We talked about the product before, and then we talked about the process of getting materials, and now we're working on them to actually design their whole factories to function like the forest next door. Um, and this is actually looking at not just the, the qualitative um, aspects of, of the ecosystem services that that forest performs, but also the quantitative. So we actually go out and we measure and we say, okay, in this forest that's in the same locale as this factory, this forest puts X amount of water back into the ground table. Well, the factory has to do the same. This forest supports this much biodiversity, the factory needs to do the same. And so when we say factory as a forest, and we've done schoolyard as a forest, we've done campus as a forest, um, the, the work we're doing with Ford Motor Company right now is also factory as a forest. We're doing data center as a forest, forest in quotes for uh, symbolism for all habitats. But by looking at what those local ecosystems are doing, asking the question of how close can we come to being able to do that too so that we're not just taking from this system but we're giving back to it um, and so this project was actually in australia and one in georgia for their factories and the beauty of it is in addition to contributing to ecosystem services they had huge productivity gains their um, employees went to work more often the employees were happier it was a better place to work. I mean, those are all good things that businesses want to hear, in addition to knowing that they also did well for the environment. So, we started this a little bit earlier with the question of what now? Like, how are we going to work our way um, out of this mess? And I believe that we can learn from nature to reciprocate that generosity. There's a lot of examples. There's so much work we can do. And that can really help us restore the balance so that we have these things that can come into alignment and oh, we can breathe a little bit easier um, as a species. I think that's in, entirely possible. I also wanted to share with you a little bit, I, I, this past trip I was at the World Expo in Dubai. And this happens once every six years. And I came, you know, feeling kind of, you know, feeling the weight of that first slide. And this is what I saw. This is just snapshots that I took from going to, to many, many different pavilions. How the world shows up and what they're talking about and what's important was so inspiring and it was so hopeful to know that the world writ large is signing up for this work in the world. They are recognizing the value of nature. Um, almost every pavilion that I visited, 192 pavilions were there and I saw maybe 50 of them over two trips. Um, they almost all had nature. Our nature, our backyard, and we're in awe of it. They all had sustainability. They all had a message of we have to do things differently. And they all had a message of this is what our young innovators are doing about it, which was so cool. Um, Poland called their pavilion inspired by nature. <laughs> Right? Romania's called theirs new nature. Singapore's whole pavilion was nature, the entire pavilion. Um, and then I just, these quotes, we learn from nature, design from nature. Um, I am nature. New Zealand has given citizenship rights to one of their rivers. Right? Full citizenship rights to their river. Um, and it just goes on and on. And then there's a, up in that right-hand corner is an example of one of the museums that they asked us to come and tell the story of what we could learn from local species in the Saudi Peninsula that would be important for biomimicry. And so we have six of those micro-museums at World Expo that will become permanent. Um, and so I saw it over and over and over, and it was just so incredibly 
inspiring and hopeful that the world is finally going, oh yeah, <laughs> we are new and we're interconnected and we're, we're dependent on nature. Let's see how we can begin to take better care. So what I hope I can leave you with is this notion of letting the planet be your teacher. Know that the stresses and, and the, the weight of the world that we're feeling here in 2022 is a small slice of a much larger narrative um, and an opportunity for us to really step up as a species. And to do so, we need to take on the what I call sort of the biomimics posture, right? which is what it was like when we were kids, when we were full of curiosity and awe and wonder, and we were asking the question, how do I live here? We were asking our parents, right? How do I figure out this world? Well, our parents, our elders, are the species. We need to think of ourselves as young toddlers, again, because that's really what we are, and approach this with that, that curiosity of saying, please, elders, help us figure out how we can grow up to be good adults, right? We, we need our own adulting process here and to figure out how do we live better uh, on this planet. And I believe when we do that, then we can create conditions conducive to life. That's why I do the work that I do in the world is because I deeply, deeply, deeply believe that we can do that as a species. So where do we start? Step one, go outside. Right? Get outside as soon as you can, as often as you can, as much as you can, wherever you can. And when you're out there, breathe. Right? Slow down enough to breathe. It's not about getting on the mountain bike and plowing through the landscape, whipping out the paddle, but it's like, whew, just be in awe. Be in awe of what is working so well and has been working so well for so long. And listen, listen to those lessons that life is offering us. Listen well, and then we can begin to echo back. We can begin to echo back all of that brilliance, all of that wisdom, and all of that generosity. And that's the work that we have to do in the world. So on behalf of all the other species that I hope I've done right by, thank you for your time this evening. <laughs>